Hi everybody, we're back. Hi. It's, um, what is it? It's November 13th. It's Friday, Friday the, the 13th. 13th. In the year 2020, so oh. it's going to be the worst Friday the 13th ever. So um, I'm hiding out here. Of course, I've been hiding out here for nine months, <laughs> so nothing new about that. Um, thought we would do a lesson today about folk music, American folk music which um, has a lot in common with every kind of folk music, not just American folk, but the definition of folk music, real folk music, is music that was written at some point, created at some point, that we can't pinpoint. We don't know when the song was written. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know what the words and intent and even the melody were originally. And if you don't believe me, just play a game of, of telephone with a class full of kids. Say something into the ear of one of them and have them repeat it into the ear of the next one and so on through the class and then have the last kid stand up and say what they heard and you will find out how folk music develops over the years. It changes every time somebody teaches it to their kids or their class or their church, um, it changes. And every time it changes, the new version gets folded into the culture. And pretty soon, a new generation has come along and the song has changed yet again. And it continues to change. And that is the nature of folk music. For somebody to say that so-and-so, say Pete Seeger, wrote a folk song, that's almost a contradiction in terms. You can't write a folk song. You can write a song that fits into that style, right? And you can write a song that folk singers will sing. And you can write a song that people will treat like a folk song. But unless it's been around for generations and we don't know who wrote it, it's not really a folk song. And of course, there are jillions of examples from our culture and our history. But I thought today I would pick my favorite. It turns out it was Stu's favorite too. I'll bet it's some of your favorites. And that is Shenandoah. Now I have sung Shenandoah, I've conducted it. I think I even wrote an arrangement of it once, I don't really remember. Um, it's been it's been recorded by countless people. It's been arranged. It's been turned into symphonic music and band music and and choral music and folk music. It's been it's been around the world millions of times. I think people in many cultures recognize it as an American folk song, and um, and and it's worth sort of thinking about what makes it American and what makes it sort of special to our culture. Um, so I'm going to read to you a little bit from what I looked up on Wikipedia. You can do this too, but I, I just did, so might as well read to you. Uh, there are few melodies as recognizable as that of the American folk song Shenandoah. As with most folk songs, there are many different variations and versions, and it is impossible to determine the song's exact origin. It has commonly been sung as a sea shanty though it most likely originated with French Canadian fur traders. Versions of the song have linked it to riverboat men, cavalry men, mountain men, and soldiers on both sides of the Civil War. Some use names including Sally Brown, Polly Brown, Dar Darby Doyle, Patty Doyle, and Dan O'Shea in place of the word Shenandoah. By the way, that is a reminder that our folk music is often all wrapped up in Scotch-Irish folk music. There's just almost no telling them apart. So for singing about Patty Doyle or Dan O'Shea, you're pretty sure these are Irish Americans. In summing up the beauty and appeal of the song, it is hard to top the writing of John and Alan Lomax in their book Best Loved American Songs. The melody has the roll and surge and freedom of a tall ship sweeping along before a trade wind. The sonorous succession of long vowels and soft and liquid consonants blend perfectly with the romantic air. The lines are a call from the homeland to the sailor wandering far out across the seas, a call not from a sweetheart, a house, or even a town, but from the land itself, its rivers and its familiar and loved hills. Shenandoah was one of the most popular capstan shanties. Heaving songs such as this set an appropriate, manageable pace 
and inspired the sailors to accomplish the task at hand, which could, could be quite long in duration. So this reminds us of a couple of things in American history. We have a long history of sailors, of, of going to sea and earning a living from going to sea in, in exploration, certainly in fishing, sometimes in warfare. There were an awful lot of people going to sea in our country, in its history. And when they went to sea, they went for months and sometimes years. And that creates homesickness, it creates adventure, it creates all kinds of parts of us as a culture because we were for a long time huddled against the ocean. We also have huge rivers in our country, including the Missouri River, which is often mentioned in this. And the Canadian fur traders, <clears throat> excuse me, came down from Canada into our country, into the wilds of our country, certainly not into Boston and Philadelphia, but into Ohio and Indiana and Kentucky with their canoes. And they were trading um, whatever they had for goods for furs. And they made a really good living. John Astor is an example of one of those. He did pretty well. The song first appeared in writing as Shenandoah in the New Dominion Monthly in April 1876. So that's the first time we can find it in writing. And it was pronounced Shenandoah, which makes you wonder if this is really about the Shenandoah River, the Shenandoah Valley at all. Um, the, the author, Captain Robert Shamlet Adams, indicated that he had first heard the song around 1850. The earliest known version of the song likely originated with French Canadian voyageurs who traded with Native Americans around the Great Lakes starting in the 16th century. The voyageurs gave weapons, tools, and money in exchange for animal furs, especially beaver pelts. They often sang while they paddled their canoes along the Mississippi River and its tributaries, including the Missouri, in their quest for furs. Most musicologists agree that the chief mentioned in Shenandoah is the Oneida Iroquois chief John Scanandoah. Our history and our culture is inextricably entwined with that of the Native Americans who were here before the Europeans got here. Even though we tend to ignore that in our history books, the fact is that we all started with the, our entire country and, and its commerce and its lands started with the, with the Native American people who were here. And an awful lot of the stories that we tell and that we believe were colored by, if not created by, Native Americans, only they often don't tell us that. So this chief's name was John Skenandoa. Scanandoa supported the English against the French in the Seven Years or French and Indian War. Support for the English may be the reason that the chief forbade the love between his daughter and the French traitor. If the story of this early English version, I mean, yeah, the early English version of Shenandoah is true. Now that brings me to the question of the words. Every time you find a version of Shenandoah in a book, there are always multiple verses, and I remember reading somewhere and then explaining to my students that Shenandoah referred to several things at once. It referred to the name of the river, the Shenandoah River, which we think of as being in mostly in Virginia. We, it, there is the Shenandoah Valley created by that river. There was a Shenandoah Indian tribe and a chief whose name was Shenandoah. All of those things could be what this song refers to, could be referring to the place, the river, the man, the tribe. And there is definitely a notion of the singer of the song falling in love with a Shenandoah maiden. Oh, Shenandoah, I love your daughter, is one of the verses that appears in virtually every version. And so the story goes that this French Canadian trader, or perhaps it was a cavalry man, I mean, could be anybody, the person singing the song fell in love with the chief's daughter. And presumably the man singing the song was a white man. And so the Indian chief had to decide whether or not he was going to let this man, whether he be a Canadian fur trader or, or a cavalry soldier, take his daughter away across the wide Missouri. And the story goes that he didn't. He said no. And so the singer of the song disappeared across the wide Missouri, never to return, in sorrow. 
but he vows that he will someday return. So it's a sad song. It's a sad love song. But was he singing perhaps just about the river or the place as opposed to a woman? Impossible to know. And it all depends on who sings it and who interprets it. So let's get to the song. I'm going to use the version that is printed, the words that is, that are printed in the song, in the book Rise Up Singing, which is kind of my ultimate resource for folk music. It's a wonderful book that you can purchase easily. Rise Up Singing by Peter Blood and Annie Patterson, I think, and they compiled it in 1988. There is a second volume, which was compiled in the 1990s, I think, and um, which is like Rise Up Singing too. It's great for campfires and for get-togethers with your friends, particularly if you are of the school, like I am, of young people who grew up listening to folk music. When my friends in the 1960s were all getting guitars and learning how to play them, that's what we sang. We sang folk songs. Then we went to camp and sang folk songs. We went to church and sang folk songs. It's what I grew up doing, how I learned to harmonize. Stu's going to play Shenandoah on the piano, and I'm going to sing five verses. What I'm hoping is that you know this song and that you will want to sing with me. I have sent you the lyrics so you can follow along with the ones that are in my handwriting from Rise Up Singing. And, um, and we're going to take our time and we're going to sing this with some emotion, right, Stu? We're going to be very emotional about this song because it's, it's such a beautiful song. So let's enjoy singing Shenandoah together. <clears throat>
us through Friday the 13th, 2020. And I hope to see you real soon. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.